Good afternoon. Welcome to this, our first in a series of interviews, in our interview series, moving away from Taylorism, a look at management and leadership through the Deming lens. These interviews are hosted by the Chartered Quality Institute, Demsig Community. And today we start off a small series with one of our five interviews with Dr. Bill Bellows. Today we explore putting the system back in systems thinking. Good afternoon, Dr. Bellows. Welcome. Good afternoon, Christopher. Thanks for having me. So I'm gonna get started with the interview and I'm gonna ask you to tell me a little bit about who is Bill Bellows and how did you get involved with Deming's thinking and philosophy? Sure, I am. Uh, <clears throat> um, I've I, I got exposed to Dr. Deming's philosophy in the 1980s, and at that time I had discovered. First, I discovered the work of Junichi Taguchi, which mm -hmm. is a long story. But I discovered his work, and then and some other work in problem solving and decision making, and became very process very fascinated with um, quality and 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 process thinking. And uh, <clears throat> that was, like I said, the, the mid 80s. And I became so fascinated that I decided that I wanted to change careers and move from being a mechanical engineer with a with a specialty in, in heat transfer and fluid mechanics and pursue quality improvement. And so as a result of that, <clears throat> I I was encouraged to uh, read things that were you know, beyond my engineering background. <clears throat> and, uh, and a friend in the training organization where I worked in Connecticut suggested, mentioned Dr. Deming's work and some other work. And I'd never heard of Deming. I, didn't, I, I just wasn't in those circles. And so he turned me on to Dr. Deming's work. And I believe the first book I read was Mary Walton's book on Deming management. And so I was looking at Deming's work and also uh, Taguchi's work. And, and Taguchi's work, I had an opportunity to get trained in and, and, and apply it, but I just wanted to broaden my perspectives, knowing that Dr. Deming's name was big, not knowing what he was about. But then um, in that time frame, he appeared at Western Connecticut State University. And there's a, a video I, I posted on YouTube or somewhere on the internet of him speaking that day. And I watched him speak three times that day. Um, very, very similar presentations. He spoke to the students in the afternoon, the faculty in the afternoon, the general public that evening. And, and to tell you the truth, Chris, I, uh, not much of what he said made any sense to me at all. He was talking in a, in a language which I wasn't familiar with. Um, and, doc, and it turns out in Dr. Taguchi's work, there's not a lot of, there's a lot of discussion of variation, but not um, common cause variation and special cause variation. So even though I was studying Dr. Taguchi's ideas on how to manage variation as a system, I wasn't exposed to Dr. Deming's views um, on that. So as he spoke that day, um, a lot of what he said, I, I, I just, even though I, I heard it three times, I didn't know what, quite what to do with it. He also began to talk about the system of profound knowledge, which he was in the process of developing. And I didn't know all that much. I mean, it was all new to me. So at the end of the day, I just went back to Taguchi's work and I thought, well, I've, I've seen Dr. Deming and the photo Behind me is when I uh, is that day that one of the afternoon lectures I got a chance to to meet him, and I tell friends I I didn't ask him a question I didn't have an intelligent question to ask although what's funny is I share a story of of um, one of the people standing behind the projector there is a professor who hired me to teach a course in Taguchi's work at the University of Bridgeport 
and he saw me at this event and he said, calls me over and he says, here, let me, I'll introduce you to Dr. Deming. And I thought, okay. So he, he brings me over to Dr. Deming and, and I don't know if that was, it might've been just prior to when this photo was taken. So he brings me over to Dr. Deming and he says, Dr. Deming, he says, uh, he says a year ago, this is a professor speaking. He says, Dr. Deming, he says, a year ago, you suggested that we needed to go off and do training in TQM and we have, and this is the gentleman we hired to do that. <laughs> and, and so I remember, I distinctly remember this kind of, the look on Dr. Deming's face. I said that. <laughs> and, um, and all I, what I tell people is it wasn't a, it was kind of a look of, of scorn. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, what I was expecting was going to be, oh, fantastic. I, I, yeah, but it wasn't that kind of fantastic. It was kind of like, uh, you did what? And, and, you know, later I realized that Dr. Deming wasn't fond of this thing called TQM because he felt it seriously misrepresented what he was talking about. But that, that was my exposure to Deming that day. And the, and the other piece, I'll say, and I just want to give it some context is, um, I, I was there with two friends from college and, and one friend is in the photo with me in the, uh, in the beige tan sport jacket. And the other friend took the photo. <laughs> and a few days later, we met with a fourth friend who wasn't with us that day. And the fourth friend earned an MBA as we were earning um, undergraduate or graduate degrees in engineering. The fourth friend was earning his MBA. And so we met with him that weekend. You know, I told him about the three of us who just met Deming. And he said, uh, you know, what, what did he talk about? And I distinctly recall that I didn't talk about common cause and special cause variation. I don't know what the hell that was anyway. But what did stand out was that I, Dr. Deming um, spoke in an unkind way um, about very, about competition. He referenced Alfie Cohn's book, No Contest, The Case Against Competition. So when I told the MBA friend, he said, you know, what did he, you know, what'd you learn? I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, but I, I can tell you this, he doesn't like competition. Now, what I want to clarify is Deming was not against competition between Ford and GM, between Ford and Chrysler, between, you know, nowadays between Apple and Google. He was not against competition between organizations, between companies. He viewed that as that's just, you know, part of the system as that organizations compete. But what he was against was competition within the system, competition mm -hmm. within Google, within Apple, within product divisions, within. So I just want to point out you know, that piece of clarification is that Deming was speaking ill of competition within a given system, within a given corporation that felt we should all cooperate. But um, again, the reason I throw that out is that I've never heard anyone speak ill of competition. We're, we're led to believe, you know, we, we all grow up thinking competition is great. So when, when the one friend said, what's wrong with competition? I'd been pondering that for three or four days. And so when he said, what's wrong with competition? I said something like, um, I don't, I, I don't know. And my answer nowadays, which we'll save for later is much different. But at that time, my answer was, I don't know. But the only thing I reflected on is that, you know, the four of us had gone to college and and I just thought, you know, maybe we think of ourselves as having won so far that we got into a good college. And so what, what was bothering me about this competition thing that Deming brought to my attention was, yeah, you know, I think of competition as, as great, but you know, maybe that's because you know, I was amongst those who did better than others. And so I wasn't, what I wasn't thinking about was those on the other side of the fence who, you know, by this by standards, may not consider themselves winners, but but, but losers. You know, within organizations, you have a 
a few winners within side. You have a few winners and a lot of losers. And what Dr. Deming was speaking to is a society in which there are no losers, uh, at least from an organ, at least from a societal perspective. And so that piece was bothering me. And I just kept thinking back to the people I had grown up with that didn't go on to college. And it's, it's not to say that you know everyone needs to go on to college, but I just thought that I had done pretty well to that point. And I was just thinking about the others that might not have. So that's um, so with that, I, I took that appreciation of Dr. Deming's work, was hired in 1990 by uh, the Rocket Dine Division of Rockwell International, which at that time had 10,000 employees, was working on the Space Shuttle Main Engine Program, which was a major, major success also working on the design and development of the electric power station for space station. And, and Rocketdyne was working on all kinds of programs, top secret satellite programs, all kinds of stuff. And it was just an amazing place to work. So we moved the family from Connecticut to Los Angeles. I joined a group known as the Total Quality Management Office, still not knowing that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was the specialist in, in Dr. Takuchi's work. And I was, like I say, as I was being kept incredibly busy, I was just having so much fun. But then I began to realize that what I was having fun doing, there was something a wrong. Let's be in a fighter, firefighter. Yeah, I, I, exactly, as, as we spoke about before, is that I was in a group not, even though I was applying what I learned from Dr. Taguchi, I was applying it in a way that began to bother me is that I was helping put out fires. Dr. Deming mm -hmm. would say, of course we're gonna have fires, but a focus on the fires is a focus on the past. And by the time you solve the problem put out the fire, you're back to where you started. So what I was- At best. <laughs> that's right, at best, so <laughs> that's right. And and for some of the fires going on within the organization, if the fires weren't solved, then the customer, um, NASA or some other agency of the government, at that level, if the problem's not solved, the customer takes the work someplace else. So you're right, that, that's a situation. What I saw was situations where we didn't go back to where we were before the fire. We went back to having, using that metaphor, there was no home. So what was bothering me was if we solve the problem, we end up back to where we were yesterday. And if we don't solve the problem, then that product will be given to a competitor. And so what was bothering me was this incredible focus on on firefighting and i and the more i learned the more i realized that i thought there were other ways to go so anyway when i read dr deming's book in 1993 after three years of of firefighting mostly firefighting in his book i realized that what i was experienced was very common it wasn't unique to where i worked or the industry and and i also began to realize that with a better understanding of his work, I could attempt to shift how the organization thought about quality and, and move it from highly reactive to proactive, at least where proactive makes made sense. So Deming's work saved me, one, it <laughs> saved me in that he exposed me to the commonality of what I was experienced, that I wasn't crazy. Okay. And he also gave me a sense of, through this system of profound knowledge that he had developed, how the, if I, the better I understood that, the better I could shift the organization to being a lot more deliberate and a lot less firefighting. Okay. Uh, so in your opinion, what makes the Deming management method um, different from other management you know, fads and philosophies that are so commonplace today, you know. Um... Sure. My, well, first I say, um, and you, you've, you've met others in the Deming community. Um, and at first I would say I, I met Deming twice. I met him there 
and in that photo in 1990, I, I attended his very, very last four day seminar in December 93. Um, the seminar ran from December 7th through 10th. He died 10 days later. He was in a very, very frail shape at that time. So what I tell people is I, I never asked him a question. The first time I met him as in this photo, I, I didn't have an intelligent question to ask him. Um, and then when I met him in 1993, he was so frail. I was standing in line with others getting his autograph and I didn't want to stop to ask him any questions. I just wanted to get his autograph and get out of the way. So I, amongst those in the Demic community, I didn't spend, you know, a fraction of a, of a few minutes with him. But amongst those in the Demic community, I spent a great deal of time with Russell Aikoff and a great deal of time with Dr. Taguchi and, and also um, some fun times with Edward de Bono and, and others. So when you ask that question about the uniqueness of Dr. Deming's philosophy, I just want to say um, others will have different answers. My answer comes from what I've learned from Aikoff, what I've learned from Dr. Taguchi. And, and Russ would say, it's one of my favorite quotes by Russ, and it comes from an interview of the two of them and Russ who, who taught at the University of Pennsylvania for many years is a you know, brilliant systems theorist. He said, the characteristic way of management we have taught in the Western world is to take a complex system, divide it into parts and manage each part as well as possible. And if that's done, the system will behave well. To which he follows, and everything I just shared with you is a direct quote from him, you know, the system, will behave well. And then he pauses and he says, and that's absolutely false. Well, it is. <laughs> that's the piece that I find fascinating about Deming's work that I find invaluable about it as a framework. So what um, people are, in fact, the very first time I heard about the Deming Red Beat, Red Beat experiment, it was in Mary Walton's book and, and I was trying to get my head around. I mean, what came out in the book was that it was a very exciting experiment. Um, you know, and, and legendary at that time. And I was just trying to think, okay, so, so people go up and they put the paddle into the bowl of white beads and red beads and pull it out. And, and I was just trying to get my head around, why is this so exciting. But, and this is after having studied Taguchi's work for a couple of years. And, and there's a few things about it that I really had a hard time swallowing. And, and, but I watched others get excited about it. And I thought, okay, there's something I'm missing. And I'll say, I, I absolutely love the red beat experiment for the vividness of the demonstration that those who draw the beads out of the bowl with a paddle are in the system and they're and how many beads they draw red or white on each dip of the paddle instead of being a reflection of them which is a a non-deming perspective as to you know qualities caused by the worker the big point he was trying to make is that the number of red beads or white beads however you look at it is a reflection of of the system which includes the worker the beads, the bowl, the paddle, you know, the, the procedures by which we draw the beads. So what I came to admire in time was, and then I realized this is what this is what excited people was this realization that that being blamed for the red beads misses the point that you're a willing worker in the system and the red beads are caused by the greater system, which includes you, but you and a bunch of other things. All right. So when I look at, you know, what are the red beads and, and the, the implication of the red beads are those are things that are bad as opposed to good. And, and this very simple experiment, you know, you, you, you put ingredients in an outcome, good outcomes, which are the white beads and red beads, which are the bad outcomes. Okay, so a given process produces good stuff and bad stuff. Other words for the bad stuff are, um, you know, scrap or rework or, or poor quality. So when I look at Six Sigma quality and a focus on 
improving quality, the the measures with six defects. sigma will be um, trying. You know, six sigma is a realization of achieving three point four defects per million, and that should be the the standard. Well, you go back. You know, and that's that comes out. You know, six sigma quality birth date. You know, the publicity dates. You know, the awareness out of Motorola goes back to the 1989 time frame. Well, then as I studied further, I went back and looked at the work of Philip Crosby beginning in the early 60s, where he set the standard for defects as being zero. And I remember asking a, a graduate class I was teaching in Chicago a number of years ago, and I said, we're going to talk about quality practices, past, present, future. In the past, you know, what do we have? And somebody said, zero defect quality asked them what they knew about it. We talked about Phil Crosby setting the goal of zero in the early 60s, which was incredible, zero. Before, and then absolutely. I said, okay, what do, you know about, what do you know about quality today? And the course I was offering was at the Kellogg Business School at the Northwestern University, which is at that point of time was like the number one or number two business school in the country. I'm sure they're in the top five even today. So in that class where MBA students learning about quality in the class I was teaching. In fact, the title of the class, I think, was was Total Quality Management. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was the title. And um, so I said, what do you know about quality today? You know, and this is in the late 90s, and one of them said Six Sigma quality. I said, so what do you know about that? And one of them talked about uh, process capability indices. And, and I said, well, what's the quality level for Six Sigma quality? And one of them said 3.4 defects per million. So I said, well, how does that quality goal compare to Phil Crosby's goal? And the same guy, there we go, same guy pipes up and he says, maybe zero is not worth achieving. Yeah, because the point I was trying exactly. to make, <laughs> you know, my point I was trying to make was that, you know, in the late 90s, late 80s, 25, 26 years after Phil Crosby set the goal at zero, Motorola set it at 3.4 defects per million, which sounds like a, a step backwards, but his, his response was, um, maybe zero is not worth achieving. And my response was, what makes 3.4 million, 3.4 defects per million, the magic number per Six Sigma quality standards, what makes that the magic number of a defect rate for any process anywhere. How how could that number be the universal standard everywhere? So his comment was maybe 3.4, maybe zero is not worth achieving. And my response was, what makes you think 3.4 is the magic break-even number economically? And he was kind of dumbfounded by that. So I, I throw that out and let me add that Dr. Deming's book, The New Economics, and this is um, the first or second edition, the newest, latest edition has a white cover. I don't have it with me. But um, at the end of this book, Dr. Deming closes with um, the following quote from Donald Wheeler. And he says, conformance to requirements, zero defects, six sigma quality, and all other specification-based nostrums all miss the point. So let's go back. I just want to re rephrase that. It says zero defects, conformance to requirements, which is achieving zero defects. It says conformance to requirements, comma, zero defects, comma, six sigma quality. And then he adds, and all other specification based nostrums. Well, what is a nostrum? You look up the nostrum, N-O-S-T-R-U-M. The classic definition of a nostrum is a, is a quack solution. All missed the point, so stated by Dr. Donald Wheeler. And what point is that? Yep. And, and the point he's making is, at least my, and I've written about this, and my interpretation is that and this is what makes Dr. Deming's work so amazing to me. 
is that if you look at the red beet experiment, and one, it's one thing to realize that the red beets are caused by the workers. But then I like to ask people, you know, if you understand that the red beets are caused by the system, is the objective of the Deming management philosophy to achieve zero red beets everywhere within the system? And is that the overall objective? Because within the Deming philosophy, we'll talk about continuous improvement. And then you realize that we have red beets and white beets. And so what I ask him is to juxtapose this continuous improvement pursuit with um, red beads or defects, let's achieve zero defects pursuit. And is zero defects the goal of this? But then simultaneously ask them, is there a conflict between achieving zero defects and achieving continuous improvement with, with the idea that once you achieve zero red beads, does improvement stop? So, that, so again, I just want to reframe it because this is what I think is so powerful about Dr. Deming's work. And the simple question is, we know red beads are caused by the system, but is the Deming philosophy about the pursuit of 100% white beads, no red beads? And if that is the pursuit, do we stop there? And if we stop there, does that mean continuous improvement is no longer possible. On the other hand, if continuous improvement is, so, is possible, how do you achieve 100? How do you continuously improve after you have 100% white beads? And every time I present that to audiences, people are dumbfounded. But now I want to go back and look at achieving 100% white beads is exactly what Akoff is talking about. We break things into parts, manage the parts as well as possible. That's the idea that all these components in the system are achieving white beads. And Russ says, you know, that the characteristic of wave management breaking things into parts with everything being good is 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 misinformed. So what's you know, what's what's how do you get out of this mess? Well, you get out of this mess, at least my way out of this mess, I mean. You know, the reason I was not able to get stuck in that mess is that I had studied Dr. Takushi's work long before meeting Deming, long before meeting Akoff. So in Dr. Taguchi's work, I knew that that all the beads that were white actually have variability and that what is good has variation. And, and if you understand that, that's powerful. Then you begin mm -hmm. to appreciate that you can continuously improve the white beads because the white beads are not all the same in terms of shape or color. And, and, and again, just to go back to your question, why do I love the Deming philosophy? Because I think the, the better you understand that things that are good are not equally good, that the differences between two things that are good shows up in how those things are subsequently used. Six Sigma quality does not look at that. Six Sigma quality stops at zero defects. Phil Crosby's zero defects stops at zero defects. Operational excellence stops at zero defects. Lean management you know, is about the flow and eliminating waste non-value efforts. But if you look closely at the quality management side, of, of lean, you'll also find that quality is defined in terms of red beads and white beads. And so, so the lean folks are not looking at white bead variation. So what I love about the Deming philosophy is as you, when you, when you see that, that white bead variation is a reality, mm -hmm. that no two doctors are the same, no two snowflakes are the same, you know, no two holes that are machines are the same, and start to pursue those opportunities, which was which was what I was doing. Then, um, and so my love of Dr. Deming's work is that I've not found anyone else which explores the the reality of white bead variation as in association with looking at things as a system from profound knowledge the understanding of psychology from profound knowledge and the theory of knowledge from profound knowledge. So what I love about Deming's work is not only 
is he opening us up to white bead variation, but he's framing that within the construct of the system of profound knowledge that I find um, ingenious. Mm -hmm.